I am Zach Johnson. I'm Mitchell Hora. This is uh, whoever's line it is, but <laughs> <laughs> this is field work where we do not follow the script. We have a script? Oh, yeah. 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 Have you Zach, read follow it? the script. No, I don't read the script. Why would I do such a thing? Let's get to it here. This is the field work podcast, a podcast by farmers for farmers. And today's a big day because we are finally going to dig into the question that everybody's had out there for a long time. It's the elephant in the room. What is wrong with Mitchell? Okay, for real, this guy doesn't just sit back and farm. He's constantly running trials. Like, is there a spot in your fields where you just like you turn around on the end and go the other direction? Or do you have to take notes after every strip across every field? Yeah, no, that'd be way too boring. Uh, We always have all kinds of different trials and stuff going on. Uh, last year on our farm, we had something like 150 different things going on. We have all kinds of stuff like 60 inch corn and relay cropping. And we did barley and mustard and interseeding cover crops, all kinds of different fun stuff that we get to play around with. But it's not just me though. There's other weird people around here too. Yeah. You're not the only one in your area doing this. There's, there's weirdos all over down there in Southeast Iowa. Yeah, no, I don't take credit for like any of the stuff that we do on our farm. I'm learning it from other farmers and just trying to help to learn along with them. But what's really cool, you know, and I think why we've had success in our area is Washington County is kind of a weird anomaly where there's a lot of other farmers utilizing no-till and cover crops. And uh, we're just kind of one of the rest of the crew. Sounds like you guys are really high in like CSP and CRP. When you look at the, the numbers that the state actually keeps, there's no denying that Washington County is way, way up there. People are taking advantage of programs like that to try to shift their management or have already shifted their management towards what's going on down there. Yeah. So there's currently, there's not really a great way to actually quantify the acres of no-till, the acres of cover crop. So one of the metrics to be able to look at though is um, government like cost share programs and farmers that are utilizing these conservation initiatives. But Just looking at that one metric saying, wow, Washington County is really taking advantage of some of these programs and really adopting some of these practices as compared to the other 98 counties in Iowa. It's certainly different from from where I'm at here in West Central Minnesota, where we're a lot farther north in the Corn Belt. We've got really heavy soils with tight clay underneath. We usually have more moisture in the soil than what we actually want, which I know is, is strange for a lot of corn farmers to hear. But uh, that's the reality of it. We we like to turn that soil over and get it to warm up in the spring because what we find is that planting date is so important to us. It's one of the biggest keys when it comes to yield, which unfortunately, I mean, we, there's not nearly the amount of no-till cover crop um, and the mindset like that up here where I'm at compared to where Mitchell's at. But uh, today we are actually going to kick off what I'd like to call a mini series where we actually went down to the Washington County area where Mitchell's at. And we talked with a lot of the key players in this conservation culture. And how did this, how did this come to be? How did this start? How did this happen? Why is Washington County so strange? Yeah. And I get the question all the time, you know, why is Washington County, Washington County? And there's been multiple different groups that have attempted to kind of look at it, but uh, nobody's been able to really boil all the way back down into it. So Um, you know, being the curious folks that we are here at the Fieldwork Podcast, we had to go see for ourselves. So Zach came down and uh, we recorded really trying to figure out, you know, who were the first people that were getting Washington County to adopt this conservation culture? Who was the first guy that was going into it? And we started with some of the leaders that are really the prominent people here today. And we started working backwards from there. So as we were talking to these farmers, we kept getting very similar answers, just like this one that we got from farmer Rob Stout. Was that you 40 years ago? Were, were you the one of the weird ones? <laughs> well, that I, was, I was enough behind the real starters that I I was less weird than others, I guess. Okay. I, I was maybe in my, right in my immediate neighborhood, I was the weird one, but I wasn't too far away from guys that were doing it, so I was uh, not completely weird. And we thought we were getting closer with Dave Burney, who's actually a farmer and the local soil commissioner. And he he talked about how his dad also happened to be soil commissioner, being into conservation way back when he returned from World War II. Maybe his dad was the original weirdo tree-hugging farmer. 
probably 1949, 1950. They were starting to contour at that point in time. They were doing the crop rotations, planned crop rotations. So this whole like journey has been to figure out where who's the weird hippie farmer. We found it. It was Dave's dad. He was <laughs> already the weird one. Right? He was the yeah. weird one so a long time ago. <laughs> yep. We found we found the culprit. Yep. I don't know that he particularly liked hippies. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it wasn't the hippie. He was just that the ponytail farmer that yep. was out there that yep. was doing this no-till stuff. Except he had a butch haircut. So he, <laughs> he had a butch haircut, though. He had his army haircut, I yep. suppose. Yep. <laughs> but like everyone else, Dave would then go on to mention other guys who were doing conservation at the same time as his dad. So being the really serious researchers that Zach and myself and the folks here at the Field Orb Podcast are, we decided that we had to go back even further in history to thousands of years ago, back when the glaciers were melting near my buddy Michael Vitito's homestead. Just had to build the house right next to the glacier as it melted. And then just extend your family within the county. Were you guys originally grazing woolly mammoths? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose if you trace it back that far. S- straight to the market. Mammoth to market. <laughs> Direct to market mammoth. Grass-fed <laughs> mammoth. I need to get in on that. It took big <laughs> trucks. So uh, we were digging into this and eventually realized that it didn't seem to just be one original conservationist. It was a really a key set of people. In every conversation... The same names kept coming up. The people credited with really getting conservation to take hold. Yeah, Jim Freer is one of those guys that everyone talks about. He was the director of the Iowa State University Extension in Washington County for 32 years. He's in his late 80s now. Uh, He retired a long time ago, but in his heyday, he could attract 500 people to his field days. I mean, 500 people at a field day, like right now, I think it's tough to get 50 people there unless you advertise that there's going to be a free meal. Yeah. But I mean, that was in like the eighties when he was doing that late seventies, early eighties. I mean, he probably just, you know, put it out on a Snapchat that they were getting together and having a field day and everybody showed up. I would assume so. That was the most effective way to get information out there. Jim, you know, being a guy in his late eighties, he seemed like a guy that is still pretty big into Snapchat. He probably has a better TikTok than we do, Zach. (laughs) Well, I'd guarantee if he has TikTok, it's better than mine. All jokes aside, I doubt that Jim actually has TikTok, but let's definitely dig into uh, this conversation with Jim. I'm not sure if we get too distracted by the cats that were running around in the barn, but when you're in Washington County, um, we're not in our field work uh, headquarters that we're typically recording from. You never know what's going to happen. Well, to start out though, Jim, we've been recording around Washington County and all these different conversations. Your name keeps coming up. And I've lived here my whole life. You've lived here your whole life, and we've never met each other. So now we finally get to meet and uh, and figure out why this all came about, and you know why what was happening way back in the day that spurred this conservation culture of Washington. And what do you think? Why why is that the case? Well, it it involved a lot of people, but it. I think one of the things, we had a a number of farmers who were willing to take risks and experiment around things. I remember when I came to the county in 1960, moldboard plow was uh, the main tillage implement. And uh, the problem with moldboard plow on the flat prairie, it had to be done in the fall because otherwise in the spring it got too gumbo-like and you couldn't get a good seed bed. So people started trying to think about how can we uh, do a better job of controlling the environment for seeding and uh, it involved people who are willing to try some things. When I first came here, Soil conservation was pushing terraces around the hill and weir dams and all that sort of thing to control erosion in ditches. Then uh, we got people that, uh, hey, let's try something different. And the Graham plow was something they used out in the, in the wheat country to reduce wind erosion because it left a rough surface. The smooth surface of, of uh, our soils in Washington County in the spring, after you dissed them and, and it dried out, you could have a windstorm that would put uh, snowdrifts of dust in the ditches, and I remember those very well. So people wanted to, to leave their stuff on the surface. I remember. Is that the picture you have right there? 
Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so. And that Graham Plow was invented out in the prairie. And Lawrence Mix was the guy that in Washington County, uh, and Bob Mix, uh, the, Lawrence was, was one of the early soil district commissioners. And uh, so he was uh, trying to, you know, try something different. And it didn't always work out, but uh, it was the first experiment. Then I, I had... Uh, uh, then the chisel plow came in with the, you know, the Glencoe soil saver and some of those machines way back when, and they were, uh, adopted fairly quickly. Well, when I first came here, we were still holding, the soil conservation people were still holding plowing contests, clean plowing contests, where you were judged on how clean was the, the, the residue covered. They wanted total coverage. They wanted a nice straight furrow that didn't break off or anything like that. And the, the, all the furrows were in uh, uh, uniform. There wouldn't be one higher than the next one that turned over. And I helped judge some of those contests. And, you know, your dad, your, excuse not your dad, your great, great grandpa went out with a moldboard plow without anything done ahead of time. And he plowed under the what he could with the plow with, uh, corn stalk residue and it was sticking up all over and it was the roughest thing you're looking at and, and it was it just didn't look like you was doing the right thing but so you're telling me the horrors of have been destined to no till is what you're telling me cause well, we were well crappy tillers. limited till oh. limited till back then <laughs> that was very limited and by the time you got the thing dissed a couple times or in the spring it was a nice seed bed and it was work well, working with soil conservation people, we had uh, uh, people that were interested in using the terraces, and uh, uh, Washington County promoted a lot of that. And some of the leaders that you've talked to, I'm sure, the Burgers uh, were one of the leaders in, I don't know, they got miles of terraces out there. And uh, that was, you know, a beginning of that. And then there you had the tile terraces come in. But after the, we started getting a lot of chisel plowing, the people were looking for another step. And that's when a few people like Don Lukoski and Oscar Steele, Dennis Berger, the Scooball brothers over by Ainsworth, uh, and uh, they were some of the early people that uh, tried different things. And we, we had the uh, opportunity to go to some of these farms and take pictures of what they were doing. And during that time, 1979, we started having a tillage fair, and we invited in companies to bring in their equipment to the uh, National Guard Armory. And we had one year, we had six different no-till planters, Buffalo Till and uh, International Harvester, John Deere, Kinsey. We had all the big names. We had more than they had at the conservation tillage fair that was going on in Cedar Rapids during those same years. So, Jim, you have a flyer here from this tillage fair, and, it, and I've got it here now. Washington County Conservation Tillage Fair, Thursday, February 26th, 1981. Yeah, it was the third This was one. a cold day. <laughs> oh, yeah. February 26th, well, 1981. Well, this even is in, in the 80s. Even in the 80s. Yeah. Well, this is, in, <laughs> this is not out in the field. This is... Uh, they this inside, in the this armory. This is inside in the armory. I see. And you'll notice down there that there are a panel of uh, participants that uh, are sharing their experiences. We took slides of on their farms during the year, and uh, then they were the ones that, Dave Burney was one of them in, I, I think, one of those years. Uh, Dennis yeah. Berger, uh, Don Lukoski, Oscar Steele, uh, uh, <clears throat> a number of those people. Uh, early years, seemed like no-till started out more interested in trying to you no-till on sod. I don't know why, but uh, they were able to kill the grass, and um, that uh, worked out uh, on sod very well without having to plow it up. Where did the sod come from? Because these were, this was ground that had been farmed before. Been hay, right? hay ground. Oh, hay, hay sod. Hay, hay, okay. hay ground. It'd be clover. We found out, though, that uh, uh, the, if it had 
uh, orchard grass in it, it was harder to kill. Okay. The, with most of the chem paraquat was the big chemical that was used early in the, in those times to kill the vegetative growth. Yeah. Okay. So so this was okay. So they had the first one of these in seventy eight. You say. Yeah. Here we've got 1980 and we've got 1981 on their panels and stuff. And there are some of the names on here of these guys we've talked with here and guys' names that keep coming up and such. So we had these fairs coming in, but really it wasn't conservation tillage that much they were looking at. They were more so looking at the planters, so too. Well, we were. But it was about equipment. It was about equipment. We had. Uh... Uh, demonstrations on we had machines there for with the chisel plows but we also got the no-till in uh, at that time and those were the early no-till people i did a survey and i got a copy of it somewhere here take a look at this one right here you'll see at how many years people have been doing no-till there that were in this was a survey handed out to the people at the pro at the fair the tillage fair and uh, you'll see that there were a lot of first-year people. Mm -hmm. That was done in 81, so it would have been 1980 year. And so you see how many years some of those people had already been playing with it. So it looks like here there's about, there's about 57 people or so that responded to this survey. And out of the 57 people in 1981, it says 1981 was my which year of planting. Or, or of, of growing no-till corn. So it's specifically only about corn, though, not necessarily no-till yeah, beans or right. something else. But 1981 was my which year growing no-till corn. Only two people have been doing it for four-plus years. Right. 1981. 28 people, it was their first year of no-till corn. And uh, the total number of acres that they had was 5,168 acres of no-till. And that was the fourth year that people had been doing it. Fourth year that some of them people had been doing it and uh, able to just. So so even these people that were saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing it. They probably weren't doing it on all their acres. Oh, no, no. They were just trying it small. Yeah. And they were trying to learn how to no-till and build it out from there. Uh, but that's pretty cool that to have know. some of those numbers. And, I'm not know. sure where you were even asking them how many acres of no-till soybeans at that time because it didn't... Didn't nobody, even register on the scale. It was not thought of yet. They didn't think soybeans would would probably go. And it, when soybean, people started trying no-till soybeans, that exploded. Just well, like now that. that's like the thing. That's easier than no-till so corn, It's so much I easier. The, the weed control, the, the the equipment needed is not as complicated. Mm -hmm. You didn't have as much trash to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting and exciting, I tell you. Yeah. So, okay, so we were having these fairs and stuff here and bringing people into town and showing them stuff. But tell us about some of the things you were organizing out in the field, too. You guys were having field yeah. days bringing people out to the farm, too. We we started way back in the early 60s holding twilight meetings out in the field with uh, a, a conservation emphasis, uh, terraces and that sort of thing, down at the Lake Darling watershed. We had a number where the soil conservation and the ASC and the extension all participated. And we'd started like 6.30. We're going in June, you know, you got sunlight until 9 o'clock or mm -hmm. almost. And uh, we'd have the farmer show what he did, and and uh, they we'd generally have an area specialist. So once in a while, the state specialist down. I didn't do the talking then, like I am now. It was <laughs> them that did the talking. I arranged it. I promoted it. I wrote hundreds of articles. I took lots of pictures, and I've had stories in the paper, you know, trying to promote it. Um, if you look at this sheet, and and it talks a lot about 1981, and you can see. 1980, 1981, there was a clear jump here. We went from, you know, if you look at mm. two people were in their fourth year, six were in their third year, then all of a sudden in their second year, there's 21, and now there's 28 in the first. So there's a clear trend there of rapid adoption. What happened in in those years so, to, to make that rapid adoption? Was it maybe that they couldn't get the tillage done in the fall? Was it low prices and there was there there was not the money there to be made and people didn't want to make the extra pass or we had good years that it worked well and didn't have many as many problems you know as we would in some years 81 was one of the poor years because we had a severe black cutworm outbreak 
that year that uh, took uh, a lot of fields that just reduced uh, the stand and and that sort of thing. Um, the I think the success of these people and word of mouth from neighbor to neighbor uh, just got people to was to enough try. to give people working. the confidence yeah, it was to just try. Just working it. enough. Yeah. So it, again, it maybe just comes back to seeing your neighbors have luck with it. And then gaining the confidence that you can try it now. Uh, you'll see here's a, a sheet that shows the attendance that we had. It was pretty good. Okay, so so here what I've got is Washington County Tillage Fair attendance comparisons. Okay, so they're looking at, they're tracking the attendance. And this is just a handwritten deal that we've got photocopied here. But it's looking at 1980, 81, 82, 83. And uh, we have it broken down into total attendance and farmer attendance. Okay, you were talking about this Washington County Tillage Fair. I was thinking this is like a 20, 30 people sitting around deal. 1980, it, it is they in a had, lot of those other counties. 1980, they had 388 people in Washington County. Uh, they tracked multiple other counties here in Southeast Iowa. This is probably the district for the extension agency. Right. So they were tracking all these for the, the extension agency because they were trying to show your numbers back yep. up to Ames, up to Iowa State. And the next close, so Washington County in 1980, had 388 attendees. The next closest county lo is Loiza County at 66 attendees. Not even close. Loiza County is just east of here, neighboring county to the east. We didn't really put out direct mailings in Loiza County or anything like that. That was just by mass media publication. Oh, I'm reading this totally wrong because this is only people that attended the Washington County Tillage Fair. These aren't county. These are not county tillage fairs from other counties. No, this is ours. Oh, I'm reading this oh, wrong. That's what okay, I thought too. Yeah, excuse me. I was with so you, Mitchell. there was 388 attendees from Washington County, but there was 563 attendees here total. So they came 563 from, uh, people at this deal. There's national events that happen today. <laughs> now, 563 attendees would be phenomenal. Yeah. And we, had, you guys had that in 1980 coming to this fair. No, back then we just uh, <laughs> held the meeting and then hopefully they went home and did it. <laughs> 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 and they didn't always do it because we had to repeat for Lake Darling a, a number of times. Be okay. There was. Uh, Cost share involved, you know, so ASC was always involved in the program trying to promote uh, their conservation practices that were eligible for cost share and the, mm -hmm. and the soil conservationists. And uh, they, he was very strong in promoting no-till. And uh, he worked, uh, the soil conservation people worked more with the technical aspects of the machinery and uh, some of these sort of things. And we were heavily involved in the communications, the promotion, the development of that sort of stuff. Uh, another question on this, the tillage fair. The Okay, so out of the 563 attendees in 1980, 351 of those attendees were farmers. Okay, 563 total attendees, 351 of that was farmers. So the large majority was farmers. But the next biggest category, there was agribusiness, there was other, an other category, but students was the next highest category. What students were that? Was that like the high school brought kids out or yes. what? Yes, uh, Vocag classes brought in their kids yeah. uh, from Washington and Mid Prairie. Here we got a we got a newspaper clipping here. I'm going to look at the date, uh, April 28th, 1981. So the headline reads, "Soil loss from April 11." Soil loss from April 11th cloudburst catast catastrophic. Maybe I should have had you read it. Huh? <laughs> Soil loss from April 11 cloudburst catastrophic. And there's there's pictures here of the what the soil did. And you can see, I mean, you look at the pictures and it's it's drifted. I mean, it to me it looks like snow has blown everywhere. It it was a cloudburst that brought in about five inches of rain south of Westchester, and it. On those, some of those hills right there, it had been disc ready to plant. It cleaned the soil down to the depth of the disc. Oh wow! The, that the disc had disturbed. And that's the, the spring of '81. So uh, we had some help from the weather. <laughs> so the weather said, "Hey, if you're going to have all this dust right there, we're going to blow it all to the ditch, right down to where he just tilled, with this." catastrophe deal sounds kind of like what we just had here recently in iowa yeah. with these strong winds coming through yeah this is this is crazy just looking at at that you know where i'm at where we uh where we have a lot of 
uh, conventional tillage and we get the snow in the winter and if the snow doesn't cover the fields you know we get we we get to see the black in the ditches and the soil that blows into the ditches and it drives everybody crazy but i've never seen anything like that so a key a key piece of this article okay this soil loss article is you wrote the article yeah you're the author on this article here does it say yep okay jim freer washington county extension director so you wrote this and you were took so you took these pictures. I took the in, pictures, and uh, you took these pictures. Yep. You wrote the article, and uh, so it was the the storm was on April 11th, but then this was published on April 28th. After you got the pictures and stuff, then you guys got the uh, the article in, and uh, yeah, had rain gauge for one night. Rain was six inches of rain that you guys had that night. Which now we've talked a lot about. Well, we were getting heavier rains and stuff. Now, well, you had heavy rain right here in the eighties too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yep. We still get erosion under those catastrophic rains. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we tried to do was we promoted uh, chisel plow. You know, Dick Brinning out west of uh, Washington was one of the early uh, guys that used uh, uh, the chisel plow, and uh, I. To promoted that as far as that article and they are, that I wrote in pictures. But then we had things like this show up where they use the chisel plow up and down the hill. And uh, you can see in this picture here rats. that the chisel tracks uh, eroded out in some of these real serious uh, mm -hmm. heavy rains as well. So you had to make sure that the, if you were chisel plowing, you were doing it on the contour, you were going to run yeah. into problems. Yeah, so the picture he's got there, you can see the, uh, the knife track or the shank track has washed out severely. Yep. You know, the water took that soft soil in that, in that knife track and, and took it out. So basically, even as they were going away from full width tillage to trying to chisel plow more in a strip almost, that if you didn't do it right, you were still going to have issues. Right. When you disturb the soil, you, you've created a problem that uh, can uh, increase in erosion. And as just flabbergasted at how fast people adopted no-till into soybeans and uh, and... Well, one of the th major things we did at our twilight tours was we had area specialists that come down with a little hand pump sprayer, and we treated like 100-foot plots, four, f four rows wide, uh, and uh, with different chemical combinations or recommendations uh, that people would come back then. They, we would do that uh, at the appropriate time. And in these fields, and at the appropriate time when the corn was foot high or the beans were uh, six, eight inches tall, we'd have a twilight field meeting out there, and we'd look and see which chemicals were working the best. Because back then, it was equipment that tried to, that did a good job of placing the seed, and then you had to have the chemicals to control the, the weeds. And if you d couldn't do that, that was before Roundup resistant varieties and all that sort of thing. We're going to take a short break and we will get back in a minute to our conversation with Jim Freer. And now you're back listening to the Fieldwork Podcast. We're going to get back to our conversation with Jim Freer, a super influential person um, in building the conservation culture where I live in Washington County, Iowa. What was the weed control like when people started adopting less tillage? Did did you just you had to rely more on chemistry? Oh, oh, definitely. Yeah. It was it was a lot of chemicals that were involved, and a lot of them were specific for certain kinds of weeds. You know, some were would not work on grass, and and other some broadleaf weeds were more resistant, and so on and so forth. So, so they look for combinations, and we had like six or eight different treatments out there that uh, the area specialists would spray and we'd go out and, uh, and do that on, you know, three, four weeks ahead of time whenever it was appropriate. And and uh, the twilight meetings were, were well attended. Those were neighborhood things. They were things that we would get like uh, 20 to, to 40 people out. Sure. And, and it would be the, the neighbors that uh, uh, 
knew that this guy was, this farmer was trying these things and he'd had some success or maybe he had some failures. But it was, it, that was these field days and stuff that they were talking about, you know, and, and getting these guys together and going out there, checking it out. There was a lot of meetings here. There was a lot of meetings, a lot of getting people together. And that is what now I suppose we're calling this culture, this working together, going and learning from each other. And really, it started out as having all these different meetings that you guys were hosting. It was a major thrust in our extension program. We allowed uh, a lot of time to allotted a lot of time to promoting conservation tillage, no-till, and uh, writing about it, and taking pictures and using them whenever we could. So I want to jump to also on, you know, now this Washington County conservation culture, of course, is has moved even beyond the no-till and, and things that was way back on this cover crops and stuff like that. What do you think about what's happening today? Well, a lot of things have changed in the last 30 years since I've been retired. Yeah. It was dynamic to see the change from 1960 when I moved into Washington County to 1992 when I retired. The year I moved into Washington County, John Deere had just come out with their four-cylinder tractor that year. <laughs> So that's a quite a change from, you know, what we had in 92 when we had 150 horsepower tractors. But now what we got, uh, not only the equipment change, but we had nobody really involved in anything that was called cover crop other than we had a couple double crop uh, where he would he'd seed oats and he, he had cattle operations. So he'd <laughs> cut his oats. Si make silage out of it and then plant soybeans into the oat residue, which was really kind of a cover crop, but it was more double crop than it was cover crop. And that's, we didn't have the term cover crop at that time. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating to see just how fast the cover crop thing, it's not going quite as fast. You know, you got to have the right combination of weather to, to make it really work, uh, uh, to get a good stand of cover crop and that sort of thing. It's a little slower, but uh, I think it's a, it's a right way to go to, if you can keep your yields up there. And most of the people that I've talked to seem like they're happy with their yields. But, and, but what's interesting is we were, you know, we've been talking today that yeah, maybe it's not going as fast of an adoption curve as tillage, as, as reducing tillage, getting to no-till, but we're still way ahead of any other group. And I think it's it's still because you already had that other wave of conservation adoption that happened, you know, back in the 80s. <laughs> 80s, yep. What do you think brought the cover crops on so hard? Was it just the, because you had no-till here. So you were doing that to try to keep the erosion down. Do you think it was just farmers looking for additional erosion control? Was the first key to it? I'm not sure. Uh, right now, of course, it's the control of the runoff of chemicals and, and uh, uh, fertilizers. That's the, the big push because of the environmental regulations that they're trying to shove down uh, agriculture uh, that uh, r will affect uh, uh, farming practices. But I, uh, I don't know how it really got started. 20 some, another, you know, it 20 some, it doubled that super quickly. quick. Yeah. Where this was, I think there was only these couple, two, three, maybe four or five at the most doing this around the year 2000 kind of mark. And then by 20, 2010, there's maybe only double that. And then 2015, there was maybe double or triple that. And now there's obviously significantly more. I don't know how many was on that list that Daryl had, but. Well, I, I think that uh, the people that were, you know, early adopters in the no-till were willing to take another risk and look at another system. It was limited to those. And I guess I think that that's the reason they were more curious. I was out there when Berger did it in 1979 and took pictures out there. Uh, I thought he was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> As an extension director, I didn't think it would work. You know, I thought it was going to be competition for the seed of corn. I bet to... you were sure egging him on, though, and pushing him to do it, though, weren't you? Uh, well, you were what... like, well, you go figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um... Talking about extension getting involved with the farmers like that, I don't think 
to my knowledge, it, it's not to the depth like we're talking about here. I mean, we have we have people that work for Extension that come out and talk about nitrogen, and they'll put on a clinic here and, and a clinic there, and you know, put a, put together an event in the winter or something. But to the level that you're talking about, I mean, I, I guess I haven't experienced that. What about you, Mitchell? Yeah, I don't think that Extension is quite as involved in that, and they don't have the have they dialed back and. They don't have the staff to do that. They're not staffed to do that. There was an extension director in every county at that time, and he was an agriculturalist, basically. Agri-industry, of course, took over much of the education part of it, uh, like chemicals, how which ones worked, and, and so forth. So uh, the agri-industry benefited from the specialists that uh, were doing the research, and and as well as their company research, and they had that base of information to present to farmers. And as that happened, there was less demand for extension to be the the vehicle. I was raised on a farm up in Grundy County. I I loved the farm. If I had a few hours someday, I would love to try to take a drive and go out to somebody's farm and take some pictures. What's happening there? Mm -hmm. Uh, if anything was new or different. And uh, I got acquainted with a lot of these people, and I found it very rewarding for me, and I could share that stuff with other people. I think that's been a key thing, I think, that as, as we've learned, you know, about some of these guys telling stories about you, is you were very personable to just go out there. You weren't afraid to go and, and help and just be, be hang out out there and just go and <laughs> learn and and be a part of it. But then it was that network that you could refer them to somebody else or they could refer you to somebody else. And it just was able to kind of snowball. I'll tell you, I didn't know as much about it as most people thought. I, I talked to guys like Keith Hora, Dennis Berger, Don Lukoski, Oscar Steele, and others that have, you know, about these things. And I learned and I tried to, Share it and encourage it with others. <laughs> We're back to that networking again and how important that is. It just keeps that, that keeps coming up in every conversation it's, today, how important it's been for everybody to work with everybody else. It's, and Jim, and we, keep, that we keep joking that networking with those guys must have been, you know, as millennials, you had Facebook and stuff and you could have just networked with them on Facebook, right? <laughs> they just had a lot of Zoom meetings. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Zoom meetings. Yeah. Well, I had a morning radio program f three days a week at quarter to seven in KCII, and I generally started out with the weather and what was going on and the extension activities uh, that day or that week. And um, then I went back home and ate breakfast and uh, uh, got, went to work later. Uh, but I used that as an excuse to get up early and get out and uh, and people enjoyed that, and I, I was a, a part of the breakfast table in a lot of people's situations. <laughs> so yeah, so you were up and at it early, and and but you were looking at the news, and you were seeing what was going on, and you knew because you had to prepare for your own, your own radio show. And so KCII is the local radio station in Washington, still up and going. I don't know that they have program quite like this no, anymore. I don't think so. I did it for thirty years. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. How much prep went into that? 15 minutes of being on the radio three times a week. I mean, that had to take a lot of prep. You can't just sit down and talk for 15 yes, minutes, Yes, I right? did. You did? <laughs> you went in there? <laughs> so what are we going to talk about today? Man. Sometimes I... You guys do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The night before, I'd pick up a bulletin at the extension office or take one home from the extension office and say, well, I guess I'm going to hit some highlights on this publication. It was a five to seven minute deal. They didn't cut me off if I went 10 minutes, but... I probably did more times than I should have, but uh, <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed uh, doing that, and and people responded to that, and it was just another another way of communicating stuff that we were doing. Yeah, That's I call really that cool. Instagram stories today. <laughs> yeah, similar to that, <laughs> basically. Uh, yeah. Well, you guys uh, got a different set of technology these days uh, to use to communicate to people, and I uh, certainly am amazed. I'm way, way, way out of date as far as uh, doing things uh, in these modern days. I got a cell phone, 
but I don't know how to do very, very little on it. I think for for being 88 years old, I think you're doing just fine and being able to oh. to keep telling the story. And but but a big thing in ag and in Zach's entire mantra is about telling the story of agriculture. And we have to tell outside of just agriculture people though too. Yeah. It's uh, it's difficult to try to reach people outside of ag about what goes on within ag. And I think it got a lot harder for a long time because, you know, those of us in agriculture will follow the stories of what's going on in our field. But if you're outside of agriculture, you know, it's just one of those things. I don't follow what's going on in dentistry <laughs> or, or in the nursing field, right? No, I mean, no. I, I'm in agriculture. And so if you're not in it, I think a lot of people don't follow it. But now... With the internet, it's gotten easier to find that information and easier to put it out there too. So another thing we've we've talked a lot about today, I want some of your thoughts on here. We've we've talked a lot about the equipment, especially planter equipment. So we talked with Dave Moeller and um, what Dave now works on with planters and what the Reed brothers have done with planters and combines and stuff. What's been your take on the ability for farmers to get access to better equipment you were bringing in you know some info on tillage equipment reduction in tillage equipment and planters and stuff but what's your take on having some of those companies around here as well there were a lot of little fine-tuning things that needed to be done to make it really work you know the side hill the sidewall broken down to get the contact to the to seed if you planted in the wrong conditions, you you were going to leave that in an open furrow, uh, leave that seed so it didn't have good soil and moisture contact and it wasn't going to grow. So, you know, they had to develop uh, uh, furrow openers, the, the wiffle or waffle. The wavy coulters, <laughs> the yeah. Wave of, I've got some beautiful pictures. I got down and laying on my, on my stomach to take pictures in front of some of those kind of equipment, and, yep. and people thought I was crazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, you, you get to see what it looks like. Oh yeah, oh, yeah that's awesome. So that's one of the, so so he's got a picture of one of the really old planters. And do you have a note on there of whose planter that was? That you're, no, I oh, don't. You, the, you can see the wavy culture there for for planting into. Must be planting into he's some planting type right of in the grass. Sod. Yeah, that's it's planting yeah. right in the grass. That's a, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is a super super cool picture. Okay, so they have a little press wheel, a guide wheel with a tube coming down over the top of it that would just drop dry fertilizer right there on top of the surface. Then it's got the wavy coulter. That's the opening system for the planting unit that's right behind it. And then it probably had some type of a closer on the back at a wheel yeah. of some kind to close it all up. But they were applying fertilizer and split applying fertilizer with the planter even at that time. Right. Yeah. These <laughs> darn cats. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, that's... We have had... Two cats crawling all over Annie this entire time. They specifically oh, wow. go straight through his picture box every time they've got to walk through. And then, and then they look at Annie like, what are you going to do about this? My daughter went through, grabbed a whole box of my stuff that I saved over the years. And uh, she made a couple of scrapbooks with included a lot of these pictures and a lot of these articles and, and a lot of the letters and some of the awards that I got and that sort of thing. But... Uh, one of the things I found real curious to me was that I found an article for the SCS annual report that was published in our local paper. They did that once a year, and this was for 1965. And the title of the article that I wrote, three-page article, uh, and then was featured in that uh, special edition, that the title of it was Conventional Tillage Systems. Are they out of date? In, oh, my God. Hold so, on. So okay, that's so, before all of this happened. Uh, I, had some, I had some questions of oh um, whether this is going to take place. Uh, what, In what 1965. Was going to, 1965, Soil 19... Conservation Service Annual Report. Wow. In the county. <laughs> I was a little bit ahead of my time in, in thinking about tillage there when I wrote that article. I, yeah, I figure some places they'd just run you straight out of town. But. <laughs> Did you yeah. have any articles in the 60s talking about um, the Internet? 
<laughs> or the Fieldwork Podcast. <laughs> the podcast. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Not quite. <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's but super I, cool. I enjoyed what I did very much. Yeah. I, I felt like I was a part of a, a, a revolution that was taking place. And I had a small part in it. Uh, I'm hoping that the farmers in the other parts of the state that really haven't really adapted as rapidly as they should some of these things, I think they can. They just need to stick their neck out and try it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, this concern about the water system, water uh, quality and and uh, the chemical contamination in the Gulf of Mexico and so forth are are going to be continuing, and we got to do a better job. Yep, gonna have to get ahead of it here. Yeah, it's not gonna fix itself because there's a lot of lot of water goes down the Des Moines River and down the. Other rivers that uh, come off of uh, land that uh, not is is not as well protected, I think, as it should be. Yeah. That was one of the more fascinating interviews that I think we've ever done. It's certainly one that I won't forget, not just because of Mitchell's cats, but because of that that literal box of history that kept going around there and, and we kept bringing it back to, you know, everybody was working together. Everybody was going towards the same goal and sharing information. And to me, it just comes back to the power of the networking and, and working with other farmers to constantly learn and continue to push forward and, and figure things out. It was almost like the mentality of them was that we're going to figure this out. You know, this, this isn't, this isn't just an idea. This is something that we're all going to work towards and we are going to make it happen. And it seems as though they have. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Zach. And um, I think, you know, a guy like Jim Freer, we could have interviewed him for multiple episodes and for multiple different sittings. And I think he would have continued to come up with more and more material. That was super cool. But yeah, the stories and just how it builds upon that, you know, circled around, one of the good old boys like like Jim, you know, that really stuck with it, a long career building relationships and uh, and really able to utilize those other influencers in the area, though, too. And I think, you know, a key thing for him was having these field days. He was highlighting these other farmers that were doing it. It wasn't necessarily Jim going out there saying, hey, here's the path forward and here's how we're going to do it. It's no, hey, here's other farmers that are in the area. They're getting it figured out. And here's why it's working. And uh, here's why we want to continue to expand. Yeah, unfortunately, not every area can have a guy like Jim Freer and, uh, you know, a dozen or more farmers that are all pushing for the same thing um, with their conservation culture like there is in Washington County. But we are going to be diving into uh, all sorts of stuff here over the coming episodes. Um, and I think uh, this is going to be really fun. And just a reminder here that I actually made a video about our trip to Washington County for my Millennial Farmer YouTube channel. So if you want, you can learn a little bit more about the folks that we're interviewing. We've got it reposted on our Fieldwork YouTube channel, which is at Fieldwork Talk. I also wrote a blog post about the project that we link to in the show notes for this episode. That's it for Fieldwork today. Our show is produced by Annie Baxter with lots of help this season from Lori Stern, Amy Mayer, Mike Langseth, and Corey Suzuki. Kristen Schmidt runs our social media, LA Lyons does our marketing, and Lauren Humper is our project coordinator. Special thanks to Veronica Rodriguez, Eric Romani, and Johnny Vince Evans for engineering and mixing our shows this season. Johnny Vince also composed and performed our theme music. We're once again at Fieldwork Talk on all of the social media channels, except for TikTok. We still have not got that one figured out. We'd really love to hear from you on this topic of conservation culture. Is there that culture where you live? What does it look like? Or if there isn't one, uh, why do you think you don't have the conservation culture in your area? Yeah, don't hit us up on TikTok, but you can drop us a message at 651-228-4810. We would love to hear from you. Again, that is 651-228-4810. Thanks everybody for listening. I thought we were just amazing.
I thought it was the greatest Matt thing ever. Damon. Matt, Matt Damon. Matt Damon sharded. <laughs>